In 1947, Gerhard Kittel was released from prison after serving a sentence of 17 months. He died shortly after, humiliated and broken. Kittel's story is extraordinary because he was one of the century's brightest Christian scholars. His greatest work, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, stands today as a standard reference work for pastors and Bible students all over the world. Kittle was imprisoned because he was a Nazi, who contributed his work and reputation to the party's research section on the Jewish question, an apparatus whose ideology fueled the destruction of Europe's Jews. During the darkest days of the 20th century, three of the church's greatest teachers, Paul Althaus, Gerhard Kittel, and Emanuel Hirsch, gave their full support and allegiance to Adolf Hitler. This program will examine their stories and attempt to discover what went wrong. At Pacific Lutheran University, Dr. Robert Erickson teaches students about the church's role in what is perhaps the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. His pioneering book launched a field of study that has been neglected up until that time. When I got into German history, I decided fairly quickly that the most interesting part was 20th century German history, because that's when it went wrong. I was thinking that university professors and Christians would have been just the sort of people who would have seen through Hitler, would have seen he was evil, would have seen it was immoral to follow Hitler. However, I quickly recognized that that wasn't the case, that if you looked around the university community, you almost could not find real resistance to the Nazi state, and that if you looked in the church, you didn't find much resistance. When I entered the uh, seminary in 1955, one of the first things that struck me was that everything we read, all our texts, all the major studies we were exposed to, were written by Germans, by German scholars, uh, most of whom had been at the peak of their careers during the Nazi era. I became much more fascinated by what these German scholars were doing and saying about their society while it was coming apart at the seams than I was about the, what they were writing um, theologically. I was always from the outset grasped by not only the question, how could this happen, but could it happen again? In the 18th century, the Enlightenment spread throughout Europe and America. The Age of Reason, so it was called, promised to bring about a new prosperity to the world as it promised to free humanity from superstition and religious dogma and draw humanity to a life built upon pure reason. In the 19th century, theologians such as Friedrich Schleiermacher sought to make Christian theology palatable to those who pursued a reasonable faith. The church's battle with Galileo and Copernicus had left deep scars of embarrassment, and the new positivists believed that a reasonable Christianity could heal the wounds suffered as the church began to wrestle with some of the peculiarities of its scriptures. In a world in which Newton taught that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, teachings about a man who walked on water and raised the dead were perceived as embarrassments. Throughout the 19th century, teachers of the church went about the noble task of searching for a Christianity that could finally be embraced by rational thinking people. If Jesus' miracles could be explained away, 
Perhaps other aspects of the Christian story could also be disposed of. If rational people could no longer believe in demonic possession, Jesus the exorcist could be transformed into Jesus the great physician. If rational people could no longer believe in a savior born of a virgin, Jesus the divine human of lowly birth could be transformed into the triumphant and powerful Christus Rex. If his miracles and miraculous birth were scandalous to rational people, then his Jewishness would also have to be rethought. Nineteenth-century liberal Protestant theologians, in an attempt to address the concerns raised by the Enlightenment in Europe, created a portrait of Jesus as the ultimate moral guide and teacher. His example of humility and service was lifted out of the specifics of his Jewish milieu. To have faith in Christ then meant to have faith in a mythologized figure that represented the best and brightest of humanity. It was then only a short leap to portray Jesus as not only the savior of the world, but as the ideal German. This theological bridge created many difficulties for the church in early 20th century Germany. Germany was seeing the breakdown of traditional society. With the Industrial Revolution, people were leaving rural life behind and moving to cities where hopes of better jobs lay. Urbanization brought different perspectives together in unprecedented ways, and it was natural for people to see this as the loss of traditional lifestyles. The early 20th century German was searching for a solid foothold while the sands shifted beneath his feet. Whatever solid ground was left, it vanished during the years of 1914 to 1918. Whatever faith in human progress existed was decimated in the trenches of France, where mechanized warfare came into full practice. It seemed as though the progress of technology and invention had only brought the machine gun, mustard gas, and wholesale slaughter. Human beings were forced to fight in trenches and in tunnels, living as animals underground. Catastrophic loss of human life left few German households untouched. But if the loss of life in the Great War was not a great enough crisis, the humiliation of surrender and the subsequent Treaty of Versailles was. Germany was forced to take full responsibility for the war and was required to make crippling reparations to the Allied nations. Democracy was also imposed upon the Germans in the form of the Weimar Republic, a system that was seen by many as further fomenting the breakdown of traditional German culture and morality. In a few short years, Germans saw a nation of pride and power under Bismarck erode into a quagmire of humiliation and failure. Once the defeat had come, the question was, how do you explain it? And there were two kinds of explanations. One was uh, that one was said, well, our ideal was right after all. It's not repentance that we have to look for, but we have to believe in our own chosenness. We have to be praying. We have to, uh, even though God punished us, he still loves us. And if we are, are trying hard enough now to fulfill his commands, to live in his spirit, then we will be blessed in the future. So one was looking for a revival a rebirth of the German people sometimes in the future. Of course, in the not too distant future, but in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Now others, uh, and this is part of a, a secularized society, others resorted in that situation to Germanic mythology. For them, the stab in the back legend was the one way to explain. And this is a, a, a story out of German mythology. Uh, and to them, uh, the home front had uh, stabbed the army in the back. The army was undefeated. The home front with the liberals, with the socialists and the Jews, the home front had actually uh, 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 committed a, a, a crime of treachery. The Jews stabbed us in the back. Well, did they do that once before? Well, they, they did, didn't they? They did it to Jesus too. One can say, in fact, uh, and they did, that uh, Germany itself the story of Germany is a Christian story. That's one way to interpret it. People are trying to say, why did we lose this war? We're so devastated. Well, 
Germany is like Christ, crucified in World War I. But we will rise again, as did Christ. And who will resurrect us? And some then said Hitler. Hitler will resurrect us. Emanuel Hirsch was born in 1888 in Brandenburg, Prussia. He was the son of a Lutheran pastor and a conservative nationalist family. He studied theology in Berlin, where along with the prominent theologian Paul Tillich, he belonged to a conservative nationalist student group. Hirsch's life and career were defined by certain political watershed events in Germany. In 1914, the First World War began, which Hirsch viewed as an opportunity for Germany to prove itself as a nation. At the same time, he was just beginning his academic career. In the ending of the war in 1918, with Germany's military defeat and the years of economic defeat that followed, Hirsch saw the failure of Germany to prove itself and yet the possibility of a new birth. Hitler rose to power in 1933 when Hirsch was Dean of Theology at Göttingen. On his research work, he was one of the keenest heads we had in Germany. Hirsch argues that the basis of German life is the folk. He believed that a German government built around the folk is better than a democracy, which is just the rule of the majority. Hirsch romanticized the folk. He believed in a Germanness that was mystical, transcendent, almost beyond description. There is in the German understanding of that word folk, and it was, it was, this was especially true at that time. There was the belief that you and I could not understand they would say it's untranslatable. We can't simply say people because that doesn't give us the, the meaning of the term. And what, may, what they mean by that is that there is something profound, there is something mystical, there is something emotional, and all of it has to do with a bond that is felt by Germans for each other and a bond that is felt with the Germanic tradition. This theme in Hirsch's work is significant because Germany and the German folk became the primary focus of his thought. Hirsch taught that a faithful church is a relevant church, relevant to the folk of which it is a part. A preaching and a church which recognizes the reality around it has no possibility of seeing itself as separate from folkish, historical life. Even as late as 1939, Hirsch insists on the essential compatibility between church and folk. There exists between German folkstum and Christian belief absolutely no division or contradiction to make it difficult as a German to be a Christian, or as a Christian, a German. Whoever says differently, of him it means either he misuses Christianity to anti-German purposes or he has come to an incorrect judgment about Christianity through some other such misuse. While Hirsch clearly felt the crisis in Germany was dire, he also saw in it the possibility of a rebirth of German culture. Perhaps a new hope for the German folk springs forth from this consideration Crises make us young. It will be a hard path, but yet a path which has a destination. In his understanding, there were times in the history of a culture when creativity and life had been exhausted and a crisis was needed to give new life to the culture. His hope in the midst of Germany's crisis was that perhaps this was one of those times. This view perhaps made him all the more susceptible to accepting National Socialism for Germany. In 1920, Hirsch published Deutschland Schicksal. Already in this early work, there are strong signals foreshadowing the directions his thought and politics would take over the coming decades. An assessment of the German situation during the Weimar period this work points out how important it was to him to correctly grasp the crisis facing Germany at that time. 
one describes Germany today most correctly as a colony of the Entente with sharply restricted self-government. We were a world folk, a noble folk, perhaps the most flourishing and best of all. We now stand in danger of being humiliated or even destroyed as a folk. Nothing, it seems, was more important in Hirsch's view than the restoration of the German folk, and nothing was more important in this effort than the restoration of German piety. We Germans must become a pious folk, a folk in which the gospel has power over conscience. Otherwise, we will not be masters of our faith. Faith in God gives two things, a clear view of humanity and history, of folk and state, which sharpens in our conscience the law and the duty to do and to suffer everything for our own folk and our own state without regard for our own person. The other thing is something personal. Belief in God awakens exactly the qualities of character and soul which we Germans now require so very much. Belief in God creates men, men of unshakable desire for freedom and genuine faithfulness, whose will no person can break in two and men with warm hearts who are capable of a complete and strong love for their folk even when they gain nothing personally from this love, even when this folk behaves ever so wildly and foolishly. In order to understand uh, the 1920s and especially Protestant uh, theology and the attitude of Protestant theologians in politics, it's important to see how different their thinking was. And the first of these was the idea uh, that uh, God had not created humankind as individuals, Adam, Eve, etc., etc., but as peoples. Now, this is connected with a second notion, and that is that these folks uh, theology, that the, the Völker, uh, would have ups and downs in their history. They would be blessed, they would be punished. Now, the Germans were seen as being blessed first in 1813 by the victory over Napoleon. In 1913, uh, you had the 100th anniversary of 1813, uh, so these ideas were uh, brought back in many sermons and pamphlets in 1913, and then came the war in 1914. Many thought, this is now the hour of a new blessing, uh, only to find out a few years later that uh, everything was in vain, the war was lost. Uh, and uh, this caused, of course, an enormous traumatization. So much of the theology of the 1920s was sort of to explain to the German people that they were God's chosen people after all, that the covenant had a meaning but, and then prepare for a new revival, for a new, uh, well, uh, reawakening, a rebirth of the Germans. Also born in 1888, Paul Althaus grew up in a German nation that had only been established 17 years earlier. During World War I, he served as a pastor in Lodge, Poland. Like others in Germany, the destruction and suffering of this chapter of European history created a crucible within Althaus. It is understandable that in the midst of this chaos, Althaus departed from the traditional Lutheran disinterest in politics. During the early years of his academic career, Althaus became known as a world-class scholar. Althaus's work, however, was not limited to the university. Althaus was a pastor and preacher who worked to build bridges between divided factions. He was known as a pious man, moderate in all things, a person liked by nearly all who worked with him. But in the early 1930s, his desire to find the middle ground would place him squarely in the Nazi camp. In light of the developing political situation in 1933, Althaus wrote a pamphlet entitled The German Hour of the Churches. In this text, he advocated his belief that Christians in Germany should take an active role in the political and social and spiritual revival of the nation. Thus, as Hitler and the Nazis were grasping power in Germany, 
This noted theologian and church leader articulated his assertion that theology and nationalism and church and state should literally meld together in the service of national pride and renewal. Althaus believed the rise of Hitler and the National Socialists in 1933 evidenced a new chapter in the history of the German people. Our Protestant churches have greeted the year of 1933 as a gift and miracle of God. He warmly greeted the rise of Hitler in 1933. He referred to 1933 and the rise of the Nazi party to power, a year of grace from God's hand. We Christians know ourselves bound by God's will to the promotion of National Socialism. For Althaus, 1933 was a year in which faith in God also meant faith in Adolf Hitler. In Althaus's eyes, the swastika and the cross now could share the sanctity of the church. Faith and folk were one. In 1933, Althaus believed that the rise of the National Socialist to power was a new morning, an Easter moment for the German people and the German church. For many of the theologians, this was seen, 1933 was seen as the year of such a divine blessing. There were even pamphlets in which Hitler was compared to Luther as the new big reformer of the Germans. And as it happened, uh, 1933 was also a Luther year. Uh, it was the year of the 450th uh, day of the birth of Martin Luther. So you had Luther celebrations uh, in 1933 uh, in which Luther and Hitler were put uh, sort of in, into one basket as the, the, the great uh, instruments of God through which God elevated the Germans in the right direction. Once the Nazis had gained power uh, in, uh, in January uh, of 1933, for the church people, this seemed as like a fulfillment of uh, their wishes and dreams, because the parties were done away with, the, the, uh, the trade unions were abolished, uh, and, uh, of course, then you had the anti-Semitic policy on top of it, uh, which was uh, very uh, outspoken already in the early part of the Nazi period. And so everyone in Germany knew what uh, things were about. Now, for the church, uh, this did not play a big role, at least for most of the part people in the churches. They thought, well, there's a German says, saying, uh, uh, a German uh, 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 idiom which says, Wo gehobelt wird da fallen Späne? Where, where a carpenter works, there is some debris. But Hitler was the big carpenter rebuilding the German house so that some Jewish uh, shops would be uh, uh, destroyed was part of the, uh, the bigger story which could be neglected. It was into this world that the Deutsche Christen or the German Christian movement came to national prominence. The Deutsche Christen followed a radically nationalist agenda that pushed aside much of traditional Lutheran theology, most notably in their use of Luther's doctrine of the two kingdoms. This idea held that two kingdoms, the kingdom of state and the kingdom of God, represented different modes of God's care of human beings and that one kingdom should not meddle in the realm of the other. Most people who know anything about that particular era of Christianity, that time and place, are probably most familiar with someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and maybe Martin Niemöller. Both of them were opponents of at least the Nazification of the church. And it's possible to think that that represents Christianity. However, there was another group, and they called themselves Deutsche Christen, German Christians. And they meant by that that they were very specifically nationalistic and German in their orientation. They draped the swastika on the altar. They flew the swastika uh, inside the church. They hung the swastika outside on the church steeple or the tower or over the front door uh, and in the process of doing so of course they're making the claim we are the true Christians of Nazi Germany 
we're the ones who represent the Nazi state and you know the enthusiasm for this Nazi state and they were claiming that the Nazis were also on their side that is that there's a, a symbiosis there also prevalent in Deutsche Christen theology was the rejection of the Old Testament since the Christian New Testament was the final word and made the Old Testament irrelevant. Some radical Deutsche Christian leaders even suggested that the writings of the Apostle Paul should be taken out of the New Testament because his thought was in the end irredeemably Jewish. Paul was a Jewish teacher and did not have the authority of Jesus, God's divine son, to overcome the supposed shortcomings of his thought. The Deutsche Christen tended to be concentrated in the ranks of the clergy themselves, although there were many lay members, in theological faculties, in positions like professors of theology. Many of them, after 1933, occupied positions on different kinds of church governing bodies, local church councils, regional and um, national church councils. Many of them shared a common prejudice um, among Christians in Europe and not just in Europe, but say in North America too, in the 1930s and 40s and earlier, that Christianity had become too feminized, right? That only women and only old women went to church and prayed and cared about church, that association of church with the mother. And the Deutsche Christen wanted to show that they were a young, manly movement, that they were a fighting church. Another of their prominent figures early on was a World War I naval chaplain, Ludwig Müller, who became German national bishop, Protestant bishop, um, and that image of the war hero, right, the decorated naval chaplain, was also one that they liked to project. Um, so the image of the movement that was consciously projected through its propaganda was quite different from the reality. The reality was a mass movement, old people and young, women as well as men, rural, urban people, educated people, lay people, um, and clergy in the dominant positions, but the image was yeah, manly, young, and also strongly anti-intellectual and anti-theological. So the movement portrayed itself as, sort of paradoxically, a, a movement that opposed doctrine and theology, that favored instead an inclusive kind of Christianity um, that was very, very simple, boiled down to a few very simple elements. What impressed many church leaders in, in, in early 1933 was that uh, the stormtroopers uh, did, for example, marry in large numbers in church. Uh, so churches were filled with people in the brown uniform. And so there they saw uh, the, the union of the national and the religious, of, of a national revolution with a religious rebirth of the German people. All House was not without reservations regarding the attempt by many in Germany to marry National Socialism to the German Church. The German Christian movement often compared Jesus and Hitler, both being heroes to the German people and opponents of the Jews. Some even went so far as to declare that Germany under Hitler was a chosen people and knew Israel. As unbelievable as it may seem today, the Deutsche Christen viewed the Third Reich as God's kingdom. As the Deutsche Christen proclaimed these extremes, Althaus went so far as to declare these Deutsche Christen heretics. Again, Althaus found himself in the middle, praising the Nazi state while harshly criticizing its most enthusiastic supporters. On May 29, 1934, 138 delegates gathered at Barmen in the Rhineland to address the heresies of the Deutsche Christen. The result was a six-point statement of belief and union called the Barmen Declaration. This document asserted that the church had only one Lord, Jesus Christ. It further stated that the church rejected subjugation to the state or any political order. The Barman Declaration served as the foundation for the Confessing Church movement. The Barman Declaration, I think, is such a magnificent document in the way in which it's crafted. The six theses begin with a verse of scripture. One of the theses quotes the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then there's a little 
paragraph of exegesis, you know, this is what this ought to mean in the life of the church. Therefore, and then comes the denunciation. It means that we, if, if Jesus says, I am the way, it means you can't have another way which the state is holding out for you in effect. The confessing church was definitely made up of those people who were traditional in their religious beliefs, who retained certainly the traditional view that the Old Testament is an integral part of the Bible and that the traditional teachings of the church and the reliance upon the Bible and the scriptures and the confessions of the church, that this is the foundation of the Christian church. If you confessed the Barman Declaration, if you accepted it, that meant you were endorsing the confessing church. However, Althaus opposed the Barman Declaration and said so in a very public manner. He wrote a critical response that was hailed and spread by the Nazi party and the Deutsche Kirsten. Althaus found the Barman Declaration too negative, too broad in its assertion that the only final voice of authority for the church was the voice of Christ. Althaus believed that Fuhrer and state could be used as conduits of revelation. He believed that the Barman Declaration was an attempt to stem the positive side, in Althaus's view, of patriotism, pride, and moral reform that had come to the folk through the Nazi party and Hitler. Uh, we now know that people in the Confessing Church were not necessarily anti-Nazi. One of the reasons the Barman Declaration does not say anything about Jews, and one of the reasons it doesn't directly condemn the Nazi state in any way, is because at Barman, they wanted to secure as many signatures as possible. And the authors of Barman and the negotiators at Barman realized that if this were seen internally as an anti-Nazi organization, they would lose a large contingent of their support. In the 1920s, Gerhard Kittel was almost universally admired. He was known as a kind, gentle man of genuine Christian piety. It was to this Kittel that a Cambridge University colleague wrote upon hearing of his changing political stance. No one in England, Jew or Christian, troubles about the views of Nazi professors who have given themselves to Hitler and sinned against the light. It is just not worthwhile. But about you we are troubled and grieved because we reckoned you to be on the side of the angels. So why did he join the Nazi effort to solve the Jewish question? Kittel's whole life had been formed in the cradle of academia. His father, Rudolf Kittel, edited the authoritative text of the Hebrew Bible, a work that is still in widespread use today. Gerhard's world, since his earliest memories, had revolved around the study of Jewish history. Prior to 1933, there is little to suggest the virulent anti-Semitism that would characterize Kittel in the years of the Third Reich. Indeed, Kittel was an ardent admirer of Judaism. In the years that saw the rise of the Deutsche Christen, Kittel countered many more radical voices suggesting that the Old Testament be removed from German Bibles. He even countered the voices of those who believed that Jesus himself had to be divorced from his Jewish ancestry and understood as an Aryan. Gerhard Kittel built his fame on this connection between Jesus and Judaism. In addition to that, he is also the founding editor of one of the most important reference works in modern theology, and that is what we in English call the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And as the founding editor of that document, Gerhard Kittel's name is still used regularly by theologians everywhere in the Christian world, and his work is used regularly. He's an enormous figure. And with this Jewish-Christian connection, that is Kittel's main concern, I also discovered 
that he became one of the most viciously anti-Semitic leaders within the Christian church in support of the Nazi ideology. Early in his career, prior to 1933, Kittel's work dealt with the question of first century Palestine. How was Christianity related to the system of Jewish beliefs and the people called Jews in history? As the Nazis came to power, his focus would become the question of what was to be done with Jews today. Kittel stated that Jewry had not been true to its roots. He believed that it had become secularized and its essential Old Testament covenantal nature had been subverted by the Enlightenment and contemporary tolerance and assimilation. For Kittel, the Enlightenment perverted both Christianity and Judaism through secularization and Jewish emancipation, and something must be done to return both to their roots and special relationship with God. This was for Kittel the heart of the Jewish question. Prior to 1933, Gerhard Kittel seemed to have Jewish friends and he seemed to have a sympathy for Judaism and the Jewish people. In fact, Kittel wrote that, wrote in 1926, that there's no single teaching of Jesus that can't also be found in the Talmud in the rabbinical teachings, Jewish teachings of his day. In this turning point year of 1933, Kittel presented a lecture called Die Judenfrage, or The Jewish Question. This lecture was subsequently published and over 9,000 copies were distributed. This document would secure Kittel's place within the Nazi party's research section on the Jewish question and his reputation as a good man who took an evil stance. In that public lecture, he outlined, first of all, a problem. The problem was that Jews represented a threat to the unity and strength of Germany, that they were overrepresented in the professions, that they were a group of people, a cultural group, who would practice medicine and law and education and journalism to the detriment of German culture and of German traditions and values, and that the only solution for Germany would be to remove that Jewish threat by restricting Jews from all of those professions, that they should never be allowed to be doctors, lawyers, teachers, that they shouldn't be allowed to go to universities, that they should lose their jobs. And in this brutal fashion, Gerhard Kittel acknowledged in this lecture that many upstanding Jews would lose their income, lose their life, uh, their life's uh, circumstance through no fault of their own, and that this might seem brutal, but that the problem was so great, and that Jews had brought this problem upon themselves, and that liberal society had brought this problem upon Germany by tolerance of Jews and Jewishness. So it was really the liberals' fault if now Germany must punish Jews harshly and brutally, but that God doesn't ask us to be weak. God asks us to face the difficulties and respond to them as necessary. So what to do with the Jews? Kittel considered all of the major viewpoints of the day in Die Judenfrage. To those who suggested that the best policy toward the Jews was extermination, he objected on the grounds that it was impractical. It had been tried before and had not worked. To those who advocated that the Jews be removed from German society and exiled to a land of their own, perhaps Palestine, Kittel objected because this too was impractical. The Arabs will never accept the presence of Jews in their lands, he believed. Still others suggested that Jews should simply assimilate into German life. Kittel rejected this view out of hand. He regarded assimilation as the source of the Jewish problem itself. His solution was not assimilation or extermination, but rather guest status. Eventually, Germans and Jews could coexist, but only after pious Jews had led the Jews back into their own folk and away from secularization. Kittel's ideas echoed those of the Third Reich. 
and in 1935, ideas became policy. The passing of the Nuremberg Laws, policies that removed basic rights and privileges of German Jews, brought satisfaction to those who shared Kittel's views. Between the two possibilities that I've pointed out, there are, of course, intermediate positions. And one of these intermediate positions would be, of course, the Jewish people are not originally part of the Germans, nor can they ever become. But for a time being, they should have a guest status. And once the dynamic forces of National Socialism uh, started to discriminate against the Jews, it was very difficult uh, to protect the Jews. And uh, all you could do then, more or less, to give them help to migrate somewhere else. Uh, but it was very difficult to protect them uh, if they had a guest status. And therefore, I think this, is a, uh, this position is something which, uh, if you bring it down to principles in theology, also in human rights, it's a position which, should not, which, which could not stand and could not be defended very well. Four years of aggressive persecution took a fateful turn in a highly organized nationwide night of violence against the Jews known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. Over 100 persons were killed as countless Jewish businesses were destroyed and synagogues burned. Paul Althaus never wrote favorably about the Nazis again. Emanuel Hirsch's enthusiasm, however, was never swayed, and the career of Gerhard Kittel as an ideologue for the Nazi killing machine was just getting started. There's a story, for example, of the, the Bishop of Hanover. Uh, I heard it from his secretary. November 9th, the November Quorum, 1938. Uh, the synagogue uh, was just more or less opposite. Uh, the uh, the offices of the Bishop of Hanover. She was in uh, early uh, in in in, his, in her office at eight o'clock, and she waited for the Bishop to come. Uh, the synagogue was still burning, and uh, the Bishop came in, and she expected him, you know, to have an outcry, at least of uh, you know of fury, of uh, rage, of uh, well whatever you know that he would be emotionalized through. Uh, that the synagogue right next to their offices was burned down. And he sat down uh, and he resorted to business as usual. So he, you know, he went on with his bureaucratic work, perhaps appointing a pastor or congratulating someone that he was 65 and retiring or this or that. And this, she said, uh, uh, to her was uh, like uh, an additional moral defeat or you could say an additional victory of the Nazis. What do you expect from a church leader? To, to stand out and, well, not become a martyr, perhaps become a martyr, but to stand out and speak out, to mobilize his people and say, well, this is not Christian. No, if we believe in our Christian faith, then we have to stand up and fight for those who can no longer fight for themselves. Why didn't they, these Christian theologians in Nazi Germany, understand the holiness of Judaism, the Jews who were the other religion in, in, in Germany next to them? Why didn't they? Why didn't they understand that having a synagogue, having other people praying in their way, that was good also for Christianity? And I have to say at the same time that the desecration of Christianity that these theologians brought about is a desecration of religion generally. It makes me worry about Judaism, that they could treat their Christianity this way. It makes me worry about human beings. If Kittel liked Jews in the 1920s, what happened after 1933? He explained it by saying that all of his admiration was the traditional Christian admiration for Jews in the Jewish faith and the Jews of the Old Testament. But that as a Christian, he had every right to hate the Jews or at least to criticize the Jews 
who, when they were offered the Messiah, refused to accept the Messiah, and th who then became this tainted race who were destroying values and cultural traditions within modern German and modern Western society, and that his, there's no need to reconcile his attacks after 1933 with his sympathy before 1933 because the sympathy is for ancient Jews and the attacks are rightfully directed against the modern phenomenon of a Jewish problem. He gave, at a very high level, a major theologian at the University of Tübingen, he gave permission for the Nazi state to be brutal, and he said it in exactly those words, that this brutality, he said, the whole world may cry at us about our brutality, but it's no one else's concern or business how we Germans deal with the Jewish problem that we face. In defending himself, and Kittel was arrested and imprisoned for his anti-Jewish work. And in defending himself at trial, he said not only that he'd been justified, but that his anti-Semitism was no harsher than the anti-Semitism of Jesus and of Paul, and that he had felt called by God, just as Moses was called by God, to enter the Nazi party and work within the Nazi party for a proper understanding of how and why Jews should be hated. We somehow have the sense that a theologian, a minister, a rabbi, a priest tells the truth, speaks a conscience, his or her conscience. And we trust these people. Not only that, but we have a certain theater in a religious uh, building, in a church or a synagogue or a mosque, and somebody who gets up and gives it a sermon, we take it much more seriously than we would take a lecture by an academic in an auditorium. So when a minister gets up to, before the congregation and says, Hitler is Christ's second coming, they said that. Hitler is resurrecting Germany. Hitler is doing the work of Christianity. The Jews are evil. The Jews are satanic. Jesus is an Aryan who came to destroy the Jews and they destroyed him. And now finally, finally we can end this terrible plague that has existed for such a long time. We can take vengeance on these Jews. Gerhard Kittel, editor of the 20th century's definitive work on the Jewish background of the New Testament, spent the years of the Third Reich giving his mind, his reputation, and his loyalty to the research section on the Jewish question, a Nazi party committee with access to the highest levels of government. This committee would formulate the ideology for the systematic murder of six million Jews. In the spring of 1945, French soldiers entered the grounds of Tübingen University and arrested one of its most celebrated professors. Gerhard Kittel spent 17 months in prison he died in 1948, a disappointed man of 59 years. Days before Germany's defeat in 1945, Emanuel Hirsch retired from his professorship at Göttingen, officially because of his failing eyesight. He continued to teach students and professors alike in the basement of his house for years to come. Many of his students became faculty at the world's most prestigious universities. They uh, came to know him just as a theologian, as a wise old man, very impressive, blind, but had all these uh, texts in his uh, brain. Uh, it m must have been a very impressive personality. And if you say, well, all the other things 
are not of interest for me. You have a completely different uh, picture of a man. Yeah? Uh, but as he himself in his writings always said, man can't be divided in his different actions and thinkings. I've never read a word of regret uh, of Hirsch on his writings or his actions. And this might be a clue for his intellectual, political, human, ethical existence. Paul Althaus resumed teaching at Erlangen in 1947 after gaining a positive judgment from his denazification trial. His sermons preached before his death in 1966 showed a note of remorse. In one sermon preached just after Germany's surrender, Althaus comments on the evil spirit which ruled the last 12 years. Whatever was evil in that spirit should now be driven out out of our entire public life, out of a judicial system, out of the press, out of the schools and education. The victors want it so, we ourselves want it so, and we are certain God wants it so. I'm not surprised, but I'm deeply disappointed. I mean, given the, uh, the elements of their theological thinking, it was, in a way, uh, uh, logical that they would support the Nazis. On the other hand, Protestant tradition uh, also contains so much of nonconformity, so much of independence, so much of one's own conscience, that they should have seen that injustice is injustice, that violence is violence, that brutality is brutality, that human rights are something basic also in religious terms, that uh, uh, freedom of conscience uh, is something uh, of, of an elementary, fundamental nature, and uh, that they would sacrifice all of that, I find deeply uh, disappointing. It is very important to discern enough between the nation and the history of the nation and God, and God's history with his people. It is not the same. Some years ago, I led a workshop for school teachers on teaching the diary of Anne Frank in the classroom. And I created an exercise for these teachers to try to help them understand the kind of chain of complicity that produced the Holocaust, that produced the death of millions of Jews like Anne Frank. Um, and I called this exercise, Who Killed Anne Frank? And I gave each of the teachers, there were maybe 15 of them there, a piece of paper with a description of someone who played a part in the death of Anne Frank. For example, the Dutch neighbors who denounced the Frank family to the police, the police who arrested them, the um, fellow inmate who took the crust of bread out of her hand, you know, when she was weak, um, the person in the hiding place who made too much noise, and so on, Hitler, Himmler. I had a large number of different possibilities. And I asked the teachers to line themselves up in a kind of human chain of complicity from what they considered the most responsible to the least responsible in the death of Anne Frank. Now, my expectation was that the person who held the card that said Adolf Hitler would immediately march to the front of the line and stay there, and the others would line themselves up behind that person. It's not what happened. Instead, the teacher who had a card that said, a German pastor who preached hatred of Jews from the pulpit in the 1920s and 30s. That person marched immediately to the front of the line and refuted, refused to cede that position. Um, no matter who came along, the person with the Hitler card, the person with the SS card, that woman said, this person is the most responsible. This person who used the power of the pulpit, who used the authority of the Christian church, of Christian tradition, to teach that it was not only acceptable, but um, desirable to hate fellow human beings, to hate Jews, to fear Jews, 
to fight against them, to attack them, this person um, is as responsible and more responsible um, than anyone else. Those kinds of things become the start of the slippery slope, you know? And that's why I think the German experience is, is so instructive for us, because if you look at what happened there um, in 1933, it started out relatively innocently. Now, I, I just think that's why it's so dreadfully important that we keep the lesson of Germany and the lesson of the Holocaust constantly before every society in the world today because the danger of lapsing into that kind of behavior look at uh, the former Yugoslavia look at Rwanda I mean, that danger uh, always lies just beneath the surface